and this one's very subtle, but it's very powerful. Shout outs at the start of every staff meeting. Hey, Sarah, just a huge thanks to you and your entire team for working around the clock last week oh, on that big got proposal. It. I heard it. I heard it. <laughs> And wow. while they had this mentoring program that was trying to tell women about how to position themselves for promotion, it didn't matter if the women thought it was going to be too difficult for them to succeed. Hey guys, welcome to episode number 97, 97 of the Game on Girlfriend podcast. So in case you haven't noticed, we're kind of in, um, oh, I don't know, a tumultuous time of change. Have you noticed that maybe, just maybe, some things are starting to look a little bit different from the way that they have before. And in fact, we're right in the middle of something that they're already calling the Great Resignation, where 4.3 million people left the workforce just recently. Something is happening. Things are needing to change. And that is why I am so excited to bring you this week's podcast guest. Her name is Nancy Murphy, and she's made a career. I love this. She's made a career out of saying things that most people are afraid to say. And more importantly, she's learned how to say them in a way that people can hear. Nancy is the founder and president of CSR Communications. And also she started something called the Entrepreneur's Influence Lab which is so cool. Her idea is that entrepreneurs are the change makers that are inside organization, right? Entrepreneurs, right? They're inside the organization and they are leading effective change inside those organizations that will have them be more effective, that will have them run better. I loved in our conversation, we talked about the subtlety and how to attract more women to more powerful roles, which you know makes my heart sing upside all over the place. So excited that we have someone like Nancy out there in the world doing work like this. She works inside of organizations nonprofits, big corporations, all of the huge organizations that quite frankly, our world needs in order to run properly, right? This is part of what we're working with. And how do we have these corporations, organizations, nonprofits work with us, the community, society, and with systems in a way that matches the massive social change that we're seeing coming at us and that we're living through right now? Is it time for them to change from the inside out? I think so. And Nancy is one of the people helping that happen. As a trainer and speaker, Nancy has shared her expertise from Kuala Lumpur to Kansas City to London to Las Vegas. And we are so excited to bring her to you through the Game on Girlfriend podcast. So without further ado, let's get to it. Nancy, welcome to the Game on Girlfriend podcast. I think we have some fun stuff to talk about today. I'm glad you're here. I'm excited to be here, Sarah. Thanks for having me. So rumor has it, you are like the most amazing expert at change. And I know when I was really like studying you and learning about having you on the podcast today, one of the things I love that you do is how you really talk about kind of change, mostly inside of organizations, right? But change kind of from the inside out and how we can do that. And I just thought that was such a great way to go about this conversation. And I felt like it was really unique. Do you feel like other people aren't really talking about this the way you are? Or is that just me? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there are lots of folks out there who talk about organizational change. I think my approach is different in two ways. Number one, I focus on the intrapreneur. So that person who brings the entrepreneurial spirit, innovation, disruptive mindset to change organizations from within. So they are that unsung hero that really does the sustained, sometimes struggle <laughs> work, you know, that, that really gets organizational change to stick. And the second thing that uh, in where my approach is a little different is I think so many organizational change experts approach it from the change management standpoint, you know, very scientific, like we just, you know, these are the, the steps and the stages and the processes and the Gantt chart. And if you just have enough checklists and move from one phase, you know, it's all going to be predictable, logical, linear. Yeah. Well, guess what? 
organizations are made up of humans and humans are messy emotional beings. So if we don't pay attention to the change leadership where we're really looking at the emotional psychological aspects of change, most of the time our change is going to fail. I think that's right. And I, you're doing something that I think is really cool. I don't know. I, you don't have to talk about it this way. You don't have to agree with me either, but it's like, I think we're taking like kind of the old school way of doing this, right? The like, you got to go through change management and you got to, these are the rules and this is what the science teaches. And you're sort of humanizing it, which I tend to call this. So I say, you don't have to take this on. I tend to call that kind of like kind of a feminine strength that we have where we see the rules, we see what works. And then we sort of add this level of humanity on top of it. And I love when you said like, "Mm, these are run by humans. And so it sort of brings more of this, the human behavior element into it. Does that seem right? Do I have that right as far as you? Oh, absolutely. And I love that you just went right there to the feminine (laughs) approach to leadership, because I will tell you that You know, I I was really excited to have this conversation with you because I I love the name of your show, number one, and and I know some of the other amazing women you've had on, but like more and more, I'm just, I just want to step right into the moment in time we're in right now, the chaos, the change inside, outside our organizations in all aspects of our lives calls for a feminine leadership style. You know, this idea of Shakti as the inner feminine, and that doesn't mean it's only women, right? We can all approach leadership that way. But coming into this conversation, I was sort of beating my head against the wall, reading a bunch of things that had come in my inbox today with headlines like the war on the war for talent, winning the war for talent, dominating in business. And I'm like, Mm. Jimmy, can we stop using the violent metaphors in every aspect of our leadership and every aspect of our businesses? And so I love that you just went right there. And to me, that those are the characteristics of credible leaders of change, of credible leaders right now, the leaders we need in 2021. I couldn't agree with you more. I've seen that in several places where people are actually actively saying, can we stop with these words, these specific words. And, you know, I've really been talking recently about um, high functioning codependence in women and Mm. this idea that you say to one woman, oh, you're killing it. It's like, oh, can we watch that please? You know, it's like, oh, really, is that what we want to be doing? And this idea that actually, you know, contributing to the world, being a change maker, being somebody who steps in and sort of sees the humanity and the rules and, and brings it together is the opposite of warlike, right? There's no fight there. That's like an encompassing. Totally agree. Yeah. Well, so as we talk about this and you've, you've really made this extraordinary career out of supporting change and you've touched on it already, but what do you think makes someone a credible change leader? Like what is that level of credibility that gets added to somebody that, that gives them the gravitas to make the changes we'd like to see? Mm. Well, you know, it's interesting that you use the word gravitas because sometimes people, I've seen some leaders, a lot of women, frankly, hesitate to step into a change leadership role because they believe they don't have the formal authority, the title, the big enough budget, right, to be credible. So I like the fact that you use gravitas as opposed to, you know, title or role or something else, because really any, anyone can be an entrepreneur in their organization. And what makes us credible is not necessarily the formal authority or the title, it's the presence that we have. And so a couple of characteristics of those credible leaders of change are how well we model the behavior we're requesting of others, <laughs> right? So we're if we're here. talking about <laughs> new ways yeah. of working, if we're talking about innovation, if we're talking about um, being more open to change, how open are we really to change? Yes. You know, we might love the idea for change we're putting out there, but if somebody gives us some, you know, input or suggests a tweak here or there, are we open to that? Mm-hmm. 
are we, you know, really starting from a place of how can I help you get what you need? And in turn, that gives me what I'm looking for in the change versus starting with here's what I want from you. Here's what I need from you all the time. So, you know, I think it's really modeling that behavior that we're asking of others, including being open to change. Yeah. Yeah. So role modeling is really, I want to say it's like almost like the foundation. It sounds like, right. It's that because you can't really say inside of an organization or even inside of a community. I'm like, as you're talking, I'm thinking about all the things we'd like to change in our local communities, all the, like we talked about the social conversations, like it's still that same um, adventure, shall we say, right? That's the, and the foundation is you can't run around saying, do as I say, not as I do. Right. Right. Like that's immediately, you just lost all credibility right there. Right. And yeah. how do we, you know, another characteristic of those credible leaders is something that I call the Swiss army knife of leadership, which is empathy, mm. right? Think of empathy as the tool that can solve so many problems, prevent so many problems, serve so many needs inside our organizations, within our teams, in our interpersonal relations. And so that sort of that same thing of being open to change we might think of ourselves as I, I'm, I love change, right? Change doesn't bother me, I, you know, and that might be true in many areas of your life, but it's probably not true in every area of your life, mm -hmm. right? So can you think about an area where the idea of change scares you a little bit? And, and in doing that, express empathy for someone who is feeling scared by or resistant to the change that you're proposing. Right. And when we sort of start with that, like, help me understand what's underneath this pushback or this freak out that you're having right now. <laughs> right. right. So yeah. that empathy is just so central to successful leadership of change, really, you know, even with our families, you know, with ourselves yeah. um, and especially inside our organizations. You hit on something I think is really important in leadership as well is instead of confronting right? Like, why are you freaking out? Right? Like, instead of confronting, it's getting curious, help me understand what just happened and the difference that can make. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that curiosity is, is really key. And I, I know we're going to talk a little bit about resist the, the different types of resistance to, to change. But, you know, the thing I teach all the time is get curious, not furious in the face of resistance. And think about resistance to the change you're leading, like resistance training, right? You go, you go to the gym, we lift weights to make us stronger. You see the track athletes or the football players, you know, they run with the parachutes on their back because that's a resistance that helps them build that power and that strength. And so when we have overt resistance to change in our organizations, that's actually a good thing, right? The covert resistance we got to worry about because then it sort of creates this undertone that undermines everything. We can't do anything about it if we don't know about it. But when the changes, or excuse me, when the resistance is overt, it actually makes our ideas stronger. It makes them better, right? It helps us see where the holes are, where maybe the logic doesn't quite flow or where we might have a blind spot that we need illuminated, right? So think of resistance as a powerful tool for making our change idea better and stronger rather than this annoying thing, you know, this negative person who's just not open-minded at all, right? That's, that's not the way to approach resistance. Yeah, because it's not going to be helpful. And I love that analogy because it is true. We put the muscle under strain in right. order to make it stronger on purpose. <laughs> Those Absolutely. are the go to the gym a lot, right? But like, <laughs> that's really the thing that we are working on is how do we make this stronger? And in order to do that, you put it under strain. And I think it's a really great point. I hadn't thought of it quite inside of organizational change before, but that makes a lot of sense. I love that you shared that. So in looking at, let's say we have someone who's credible here, someone who really is a great role model, someone who understands empathy and, and really loves to be curious and they do start to bump up against the resistance. What are, I know you talk about there's three specific types of resistance. And I think we started to hear a little bit of that, but I'd love to hear what those are. And like, what do we even do about that when that starts to happen? Yeah. So I've, 
identified three common types. There, you know, there are probably more, but these are the three I see over and over again. And my guess is these are going to sound familiar to you and to many of your, your listeners. So the first are the what ifers, right? These are the sort of like Eeyore in the from the Winnie and <laughs> Winnie the Pooh story. Right? <laughs> yes. Um, the doomsday people, you know, they're they're like they go to the deepest, darkest place they possibly can the second the idea comes out of your mouth, right? Well, what if we make that change and all of our customers walk out the door? Or what if we do that and the staff revolts and, you know, or the regulators come after us and we lose our license and, you know, they, they just really assume the worst case scenario. So, and these oftentimes are the general counsels in our organization or the CFO, the comptroller, you know, and th that's these people's jobs mm -hmm. to protect the organization to prevent us from taking unnecessary or unthoughtful risk, right? Mm -hmm. So what we can do for this type of resistance is invite them to play to their strengths, right? Tell them, please, let's, let's do some scenario planning. And I love this type of resistance, actually, because if any of your listeners are like me, where I tend to be overly optimistic sometimes about how things are going to turn out and how easy it's going to be and how I don't know what you're talking happen. about. Yeah. hundred percent. hundred percent. Yeah. I need these folks, right. To yeah. tell me the mistakes that I'm not seeing I'm about to make. Right. So yeah. I need them to sort of balance my overly optimistic attitude. So we invite them in to do some scenario planning, go to that deepest, darkest place. You know, what is the worst thing that, that could happen? Okay, how likely is that to happen? Well, even if they tell me it's 50% likely, then okay, what would we do if it did? Or what can we put in place now to make that less likely to happen? So these folks can be great allies when you don't dismiss their concern and anxiety, but you put it into a useful box, right? So that's what we want to do with the what ifers. Okay. Okay. So they're there for a reason. And it's all yeah. too going back to empathy, right? It's their, it's their job to protect us. And so while it might feel annoying in the moment, right? Like it can be like, don't rain on my parade, but the, to really recognize they are performing their role, which is to, which is to protect. Right. And, and to have that balance, right. So that we're not moving, you know, unnecessarily fast, too risky, right? Or, but we're also not stuck in the mud. So you need both perspectives to succeed. So the second type of resistance to change are the status quo defenders. So we know these folks because they're the ones sitting in the room saying, well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. We've heard that before. Yes. And, you know, that <clears throat> that might be true. It may not be broken, although there are many things inside our organizations that are in many cases. But the status quo defenders, again, have some empathy. Right. These are often folks who not only are comfortable in the status quo, but they see it as tied to their identity because they were likely the ones who created it, right? They maybe were part of building the current systems, processes, tools, ways of working, um, culture, whatever it is, right? So when we attack the status quo, they perceive it as attack on themselves. So we want to be really careful. We can use language like, you know, th things are pretty good. They could be even better. Or this served us really well for the last decade. But, you know, gosh, the, the context in which we're operating right now is very different. So we, we need to bring this process or this way of working into, you know, adapt it for the new context. Or it may have seemed like that was really serving us well, but you know, we weren't we weren't paying attention to the fact that some people were getting left behind in that or weren't being treated equitably in that system or that scenario, right? So we also can invite these folks in with some clear criteria and parameters 
to help us identify what about the status quo, what about the current whatever, um, should we protect and preserve as we move forward, right? Oftentimes it's not throwing everything out the window and you know blowing it all up and starting from scratch. There are some key elements we wanna carry forward. So help us figure out what those are. I love that. You know, the second you said that their identity felt attacked because they were probably one of the people that helped create it, that like the empathy piece, at least for me, just went off there. I was like, oh my gosh, I totally got that. And I think the other cool thing about what you're saying is you invite them in is if, oh my gosh, if they were able to create things that had been working for as long as they were, they're probably really great people now that they can see more things that can be done to help create new status quos, right? New ways to do things where people are included or the systems aren't broken or we keep up with the times technologically, all those things. And I I never thought of it that way. Oh my gosh, that was really cool, Nancy. I really like that one. Oh, good. Good. Yeah, that's super valuable for people. I know. I feel like I just heard like a bunch of epiphanies go off (laughs) in people's heads. Like it was like, oh my gosh, I know. that's Light bulb, light bulb, light bulb. (laughs) Yeah, I was like, oh, that's how we talk to them. I get that now. That was so cool. So these are the first two um, different types of resistance we can come up against. What's the last one that you see the most often? So the last one are those yes knowers, those you know folks who sit in our office or in the town hall, in the team meeting, and they're shaking their head. Yeah, this all sounds great. Yeah, yeah, I'm on board. Right. Let's go. They walk out the door and do the exact opposite. Oh yeah, I know that guy. No, I'm just kidding. So frustrating. <laughs> yeah, no, we all know these oh people. Oh my right? gosh, so yes. The yes because knowers, it's not that's like they're sitting in the room with their body language, you know, or they're 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 in, but then they don't do what it is they committed to. So it's confusing, right? So again, when we sort of get curious, not furious, we can determine there are a few subtypes to this one. And so is that yes, no about a lack of will or a lack of way? So if it's a lack of will like the stallers, for example. These are the folks, you know, in our large organizations, they've been around for a long time. They were here long before you walked in the door with your crazy change ideas. They're going to be here long after you get frustrated and give up on this change or walk out the door altogether. So they're just going to wait you out. Got it. They're going to drag their feet. They're not going to be overtly, you know, push their, yeah, yeah, this all sounds great. But then they know if they just drag their feet enough, right? If they stall long enough, they won't have to do it. Wow. So for those folks, and this is where when the change leader is in a position of formal authority, you know, you you can create and enact consequences. And that's an important piece for these stallers, right? Because if the organization is in fact moving in this direction, if this is the culture we're creating, if this is the new way we're doing things, these are the new strategies and approaches, then you got to get on board or there are consequences, Mm -hmm. right? So those have to be meaningful to those stallers and they have to be real. They have to, in fact, occur, right? So the, if it's not a lack of will with these yes, no folks, then it's often a lack of way. And so one of those examples is the, um, the strugglers, right? And so these are folks who want to do what it is we've asked them to do, but because we've left behind these little things that we call at CSR communications call artifacts, that tell us who and what we value, what really matters and how things really get done around here. And sometimes those artifacts conflict with the change we want. So now people are like, yes, yes, I wanna do this, but wait, I'm getting all these signals that tell me something else is important, not this thing, or that tell me this is how things really get done around here. And now you're making it really hard. There's too much friction, or I don't believe you. I don't believe that you really want this change because all these little things left behind are telling me something else. So it erodes trust. It makes it too hard for people to do what it is we're asking them to do. So they struggle, right? They really, it's not that they don't want to do it. We've just made it way too hard for them to actually act in the ways we want. 
Can you give us some specific examples? I love this concept of artifacts. Can you give us some specific examples of some that you've seen that maybe are hopefully a little bit general? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'll give you an example from um, an international nonprofit organization that was, I don't know, I think maybe 98% US government funded okay. at this point in time. And they decided they wanted to diversify their funding to bring in more corporate partners, more private foundations. And so, you know, they started telling teams, you got to look for these different types of grant opportunities. You've got to submit more, but we got to build partnerships. We got to do all this stuff. Great. People were enthusiastic. It seemed like it was going to open up some new doors and allow them to do some different things. All of their proposal checklists, processes, protocols were all of the implementation tools were designed to serve one donor. And that donor is the US government. And, you know, writing a 400 page, very technical proposal is very different than a foundation that wants three pages. And, you know, like, yeah, but, okay. but they weren't allowed to like get it out the door without the 400 page checklist done. Right. right. So it was like, well, wait a minute. You've all of these processes are designed for this and not. So you're telling me to do this, but you're making it almost impossible for me to actually do it. Oh my gosh. I'm so glad I asked for an example. Cause that makes so much sense where it's almost like you're, it feels like to the person who's going through this, it's like, you're trying to break all the systems, but then telling them to use the systems. Yes, exactly. <laughs> right. Exactly. Like, yeah. Right. Okay. That so makes that's hard. Sense. I mean, another example is with an organization that was struggling to retain women leaders. Mm. And so they, you know, people, women would get to a certain level in the organization and they would be up for a promotion, they would leave. And so they tried a mentoring program, right? We've all seen these. They appointed a gender council to advise the CEO. And it wasn't until we came in with our archaeological excavation process that we do, and we observed a few artifacts that were definitely in conflict with that change. One was standing 7.30 a.m. leaders meetings. And the other were, and this one's very subtle, but it's very powerful, shout outs at the start of every staff meeting that all sounded something like, hey, Sarah, just a huge thanks to you and your entire team for working around the clock last week on that big proposal. Oh, got it. I heard it. I heard it. <laughs> so then, you know, wow. these women are like, well, okay, you're telling me yes. that the organization values me. You're telling me we want equity in leadership. You know, we want more women. We want all the world is my oyster, except if I want to have any sort of work life balance or any sort of family life, or if I already have family obligations, you're telling me to move to the next level is going to be really, really hard for me. Mm -hmm. And while they had this mentoring program that was trying to tell women about how to position themselves for promotion, uh, it didn't matter if the women thought it was going to be too difficult for them to succeed. Oh my gosh, that landed. Oh my, I absolutely saw that happen. Like as you describe that, and I can see that as an artifact, right? And I think what's so cool about what you're pointing to, and I do think we're seeing this in society as well, right? It, this things that were put in place that were meant to do well are not doing well for the per people they were intended to do well for. It's like, it's almost like, tell me if I have this right, Nancy, but I think too, as we go into effect change, it's understanding what the people actually want as opposed to what we think they're supposed to want. Does that seem true? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I, it, it's funny to me in when I share that artifact story, that second one with men, a lot of times I get these puzzled looks, right? Like, well, well but they were shouting out, they were giving a recognition. They were like, that's awesome. Like, is it, what are, well, I call those sometimes the glory stories, right? What do we celebrate in our organizations? What are those myths and legends we tell over and over again? And what signals do they send? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the best thing about those two examples is 
to fix those didn't cost a dime or require any special authority, right? right. Now, right. the US government to the what there were lots of checklists and protocols and some of those had to be in place for the US government. So those are artifacts that are sometimes harder to overcome. But in that second example, like all that takes is the senior leader, the CEO being self-aware of if I'm going to give a shout out, I'm going to give a shout out to Sarah's team for deciding not to go after that proposal because the timeline was too short and it was going to mean everybody had to work around the clock all week. And so kudos to you for realizing the trade-off, like it wasn't worth it. I love that. Yes. And, and I love that you highlighted that it's free. And so much of, I think, some of the most powerful change we can make is but it really is that first step of awareness, like you said. I think that's so great. Yeah, so we just, you know, with, with all these types of resistance that we've covered, there are concrete, sometimes fairly straightforward, simple things we can do to overcome them. And I think that artifacts piece is so, so, so important because I've seen it. I mean, this is where the emotional, the psychological, right? These are subtle signals that are out there, but boy, they tell powerful stories and, you know, they will create the biggest friction or erode trust so significantly if we're not paying attention to them, if we're not unearthing them. And even if there's nothing, like if there's a regulation, right, we can't do anything about that. You got to at least call it out. Because mm. when you do and you say, we know this is incongruent with the direction we're moving. We can't do anything about it right now. So we're just going to sort of put a box around it and go, yeah, we know this sucks, right? We know it's confusing, right? But not addressing it makes it worse. So yeah. we got to unearth those ones, address the ones we can lay down the new artifacts that will reinforce the change we're leading. I love it. I'm completely on board. And it's that whole thing of like telling the truth that sometimes people think if we ignore something, it's going to get better. And that always makes it worse. Always. So I think it's so great that you are highlighting how it is we as humans can actually cause some of this stuff to happen and even share about it too. I think that example, like you said, that some people are puzzled by that, but it was a good thing. Yes. But you have to understand the underlying message is we reward that we don't right. reward family life balance, right? Like that whole, that whole scenario there. I thought that was just brilliant, but then not talking about that either, right? That just makes that worse because then people assume it's supposed to be that way, as opposed to, like you said, a regulation where it's like, we can't do anything about this, but we're fully aware it's not ideal. Um, and that acknowledgement can go such a long way for people and helping them feel, I love how you say um, eroding trust. It can help really gain that trust and like yes. that understanding, like we're in this together that's crazy. We know, we know, we know we can't do anything about it. So right. we're just gonna, like put the little box around it, right? Yeah, it's so great. <laughs> it's so great. So when you and I were talking before we hit record today, you were talking about there are five, the five C's of change. Can you share those with us? Yeah, the the sort of five C's of um, change leadership. So what what are those things that leaders sort of need and in their toolbox, right? So that first one is credibility. Okay, right? we we talked okay. about that um, for sure. So how how am I ensuring that before I step out there or as I step out there um, with my change idea that you know, people are going to receive it, that I'm, I'm going to get um, the attention and respect that I need to be able to move forward. And that's something I can own, right? I can't control other people's resistance or reaction, but I can control how I show up. And the other is, um, the second one is clarity. Okay. So a lot of times we... <laughs> We've been noodling around this vision, this idea for a long time in our heads before we say it out loud. And sometimes we skip a few steps when we do communicate it, right? Or we get people all excited about the end goal, but we haven't given them the on-ramps to join us. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've been working with a, a city agency for a while around um, some big systems change work um, in their workforce system. And I think for a while it was, you know, the, the end vision was very clear and really exciting and compelling, but people didn't know where to step in. 
So it was like, yes, yes, I'm on board. It was a little bit of those yes, knowers, but then they wouldn't do anything different because we didn't give them the on-ramp. So being really clear about that and about those on-ramps. Got it. So it's not just clarity in the long-term, it's clarity on the how and how people can participate. Yeah. I mean, there is that Simon Sinek, right? We want to start with why. We want to get people on board. Yeah. And then it might be, I haven't figured all the how out yet. So let's do it together. But let, you know, I'm not just going to put the vision out there and then walk away and expect it to happen. Right. Right. Which can sometimes be the case. And, and that leads to communication. Got it. And so that clarity and that communication are really closely tied. Right. I often talk about we as change leaders need the campaigners commitment. So we would all love to proclaim our vision for change once done. It's out there. Everybody's on board. <laughs> oh, right, in, yeah. right? Like, <laughs> like the candidate on the campaign trail, right? We need to repeat our stump speech over and over and over with the same level of enthusiasm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's not that one and done. It really is a, you know, communication is such a core element of this. So again, we can have all the Gantt charts and the science and the linear progression and everything else, but this is really all about effective communication. Got it. And then that fourth one is the curiosity that we've talked about. Oh, great. Okay. I'm good. I'm glad that right? put that in there because I think it's so huge. I love that you're sharing this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we just, we really need to be so, so open mm. because the second that, that we assume we have all the answers, <laughs> Right, which can be a big one um, for some leaders who are used to always being right or at least not having people tell them when they're wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. We've got to really be curious. What what am I missing here? Yeah. Where where am I putting the organization at undue risk? What's the pattern that I'm seeing in this, and how am I contributing to that? Right. It's like I've got a whole series of questions that I encourage leaders to sort of reflect on themselves, and then some tools they can use to sort of help get underneath and behind um, that resistance or that that perceived pushback right and then the final the final c is that commitment so and this is our commitment and getting securing the commitment of others around us to the change because one of the reasons that i got so Mm -hmm. committed to working with intrapreneurs is because I would see over and over again, they, you know, folks would get like just to the tipping point, like where their change was really going to like spread. You know, it was like that Sisyphean task, pushing the rock up the hill and having it roll back and beating the head against the wall and just the frustration. And so right before they were going to get, they would give up and leave. Ah. And I know we need to leverage the power, scope, scale, expertise, financial stability of these large organizations to get the change we want in the world. So I want them to succeed. So how do we support them in that commitment so that they don't give up too soon when they're just this side of having it realized? And then how do we build that commitment across the organization uh, from others? And when, when leaders sort of question their own commit commitment or they're not they're not sort of all in all the time which can happen you know we're human too right right but i often describe it as leading change like a new york city cab driver you know that like slam on the gas slam on the brake slam on the gas <laughs> slam on the brake yes. you've ever ridden in the back of a cab yes. you know? and by the time we get to the destination, you know, we're all kind nauseous. of shaken yeah. up and we're definitely <laughs> yeah. nauseous and we're right. feeling a little scared because we don't know what's going on. And, and yeah. so how do we sort of smooth that out so that we're not like jumping ahead and pushing everybody really fast and then hitting a panic moment. And maybe this isn't the right thing to do. And, oh my gosh, are we going to fail? And then you slam on the brake. And so nobody wants to feel jerked around. So we got to sort of smooth out that commitment. Oh, I love it. I love it. And also too, I feel like we're living at such a time when people just give up like, Oh, it got hard. So I quit, you know, cause there's so many other things for us to focus on. There's so many other things to try so many other avenues we can look at so many shiny balls that that commitment piece, I think is, is kind of the bow <laughs> that ties it all together. Right. Because you can be 
empathetic and you can be clear about what you want to do and you can communicate about it. But if you're not truly committed to it and role modeling that commitment, you can see how this just falls apart really quickly. Well, and you know, the funny thing is that just like there are people who are serial entrepreneurs, we have a lot of serial intrapreneurs. And so, you know, people will get to that part and then they're like, oh, look, bright, shiny object, another opera, somebody wants to bring me in to lead change, or there's a, so I'm going to go over here and start, you know, and so they're serial, but I want them to be serial entrepreneurs who, you know, get the acquisition and they sell for, you know, like I I want them to realize the end goal, not just sort of keep starting and then hitting that same sticking point or stalling point and then walking out the door. That's so cool. Yeah. Those barriers are no joke, right? Like having them really see that commitment can get them through all the way through to the the prizes, sometimes golden prizes all the way at the end, but that those exist, but not without commitment. Yeah. Very cool. Well, Nancy, little birdie told me you might have a little gift for all of our listeners and viewers today. Can you share with us what that is and where they can find it? Yeah. So we have something called ingenious which are weekly actionable gems that you can read, listen to, or watch in two minutes or less and immediately act on in your change leadership efforts to solve the problem of of the hour of the week delivered right to your inbox. And who has time for all the great things we'd love to read a 20 page newsletter, but nobody has time for that. So these are two minute actionable gems. They can get them at csrcommunications.com forward slash weekly and sign up there. I love it. You guys, we're going to put a link to that under this video and in the show notes for those of you listening so that you guys can go grab that. And I love that you have made it digestible. You've made it quick because heaven knows we all have short attention spans and we're all really busy. But that doesn't mean that personal and professional development should stop. So thank you for doing that. I think that's so great. And I appreciate that it's short and fast and every week. I love it. I love it. Well, listen, Nancy, thank you so much for being here with us today. I know our girlfriends are going to take a lot away from this. And I just appreciate the work that you're doing. And I'm so grateful there are women out there like you doing what you're doing. Oh, thanks to you, Sarah, for putting this platform together and having such amazing guests on. I'm glad to be part of it. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy.